Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 283rd New Social Environment. I'm Henry Addison, a production assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Catherine Bradford and Nancy Prinsenthal. As always, we will conclude today's event with a poem. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgments. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking, which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of settler colonialism as a part of the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy. We honor those that we have lost uh, to this violence. I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's host, Nancy Prinsenthal is a Brooklyn-based writer whose book, Agnes Martin, Her Life and Art, received the 2016 Pan American Award for Biography. She is the former senior editor of Art in America and has also con contributed to Art Forum, Parquet, The Village Voice, and The New York Times. She's the author of Hannah Wilka and Unspeakable Acts, Women, Art, and Sexual Violence in the 1970s. Her essays have appeared in monographs on Shireen Nishat, Doris Salcedo, Robert Mangold, and Alfredo Jar, among many others. She has taught at the Center for Curatorial Studies, Bard College, Princeton University, and Yale University, and is currently on the faculty of the School of Visual Arts. Nancy, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And um, thank you, one and all, for um, being here today to hear this conversation. It is my very great pleasure to um, introduce and then have a conversation with an artist who creates richly complicated um, human worlds that are only possible in paint. Catherine Bradford has a dynamite exhibition now on view at the Canada Gallery in Tribeca. I urge anyone who hasn't already seen it to hurry on down if you're here in New York. Um, throughout the big blooming paintings that are on view, there are expressions of congregation and of caring and of family and of the independent lives of color and image. Kathy was born in New York, raised in Connecticut, and now lives and works in Brooklyn. She spent her early adulthood in coastal Maine and began to paint while living there. Its seascapes can still be discerned in her imagery. She has exhibited widely, especially in recent years, participating in exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Brooklyn Museum, the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Tang Museum, Prospect for New Orleans, among others. Her work has been acquired by the Metropolitan Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, the Dallas Museum of Art, the Menil Collection, I'm abbreviating here, and the Portland Museum of Art in Maine, where a touring survey will open in 2022. Kathy has taught at Yale and at Skowhegan, and is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Joan Mitchell Grant. Her current exhibition at Canada is, I believe, her third solo exhibition there. It is titled Mother Paintings. And I think she will talk about why, among many other things, in the presentation and conversation that follows. So now, Kathy, I very um, gratefully hand it over to you. Oh, Nancy, thank you for that nice introduction. I am very honored to be paired with you because I long admired your writing, books, essays, and to be able to have a conversation with you on this platform provided by the Brooklyn Rail is very exciting to me. Thank you, Fong Bui and Nick and Henry and the whole team at Brooklyn Rail that is giving us this opportunity. Nancy suggested that I show early work and some of the influences that went into the paintings that I have up now in New York. So that's where I'm gonna start. And Henry has said I can share the screen. So that is what I'm going to do. Uh, 
How's that working? I don't think we can see it yet. I wonder what I need to do. You can't see it. Not yet. I can see it. Hmm. Have you selected the right window in the share screen? I clicked Section. on the green shared screen thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you just want to say a few words, Kathy, someone from our team will pull it up in just yeah. a sec. Okay. All right. I have uh, about 11 paintings up in a show in New York now. And when Nancy Prinzenthal said, why don't you show earlier work and also some of the artists that influence you to do this show. I thought, oh no, I can't do that. That's too hard. But it was a good assignment and, I, and I'm grateful that she asked me to do that because it helped me understand where I came from and how I actually went from struggling in earlier years to actually putting a show up. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Is it the way you want it? It looks great, yes. It's good. The, these two paintings were done in 1999 of single figures on a color field and they were outlined in black. One is of a flying woman with a cape and the other is of a swimmer. And I think I was um, looking for my arrows, which have disappeared. I need those arrow, yes. I think I was very enthralled by Susan Rothenberg, who did these enormous paintings that seemed to be of a field of color, but she put a real thing in them, this very engaging horse. And I immediately thought, oh, that's a good idea. I'd like to do that. They were simple. And I was, a, I was an abstract painter then, but I saw what she gained by putting that horse in the middle was uh, an emotional element that maybe pure abstraction didn't have. Having trouble with the arrows again. Well, Kathy, you may need to just call out when you want to move to our next slide because um, we're managing the slideshow. <laughs> ah, <laughs> all right. So just call out whenever. This painting I did in, in 2015, and it was one of the first paintings I did that got a wider audience than I would used to. I it's called Fear of Waves. And I made, I didn't continue with the big new image Susan Rothenberg idea. I made my figures very little. And you can see that I put them in a, a believable context of water with waves rolling in. So although it looks like a monochrome painting, I actually realize that if I painted it all one color like blue, um, that I could insert my people into something that was a real life landscape or seascape. Next slide. And that's what I did. I, I made, it was strange. I would put blue paint down and it always looked like water. So it was an easy step to put people in it. And they were proportionately the right size for sky and sea. Next slide. This painting, which was of a wading pool in a starry night, 
was kind of a breakthrough because I stumbled on the idea of putting my people in outer space. And the way I got there was, next slide. This painting looked like this. It had a plane flying through a starry sky. And I just kept looking at it and thinking, this is not interesting. I have to do something, but I didn't know what. Can you go back to the, to the wading pool in the sky? I, it, I had a show that was opening in January. The month was December and I went down to Miami for the Basel art show. Miami was warm in December and people, the art show was in a hotel and there were these little pools, these warm pools all around that people were sitting in. And I, I said, oh, I know what to do. And I ran back to my studio in New York, next slide. And I took out this airplane and put in a pool. And after I did that, I realized that it was a much more interesting idea that the plane was the obvious thing you'd see in the sky and the pool made people ask questions. What are these men doing? Where are they? And so on. Next slide. This painting I did in 2018, and it, it was uh, the first time that I used chunks of color to build up my figures. I sort of see what's been happening in the last several years is a search for how to put people in my paintings. How realistic, how colorful, who were the people, what color were the people, this uh, strange naked woman floating through the painting, um, we're gonna talk about later. Under the, under, the, under the heading of humor. <laughs> Next slide. This painting of a woman and child was at, at FIAC in Paris and I expanded my idea of taking a big brush, putting areas of color to make a figure, this time a mother and child, which I, I didn't realize at the time that I would also build on that subject. Next slide. There you can see more closely how, uh, how lumpy the areas of color were. I, I, you know, you can see from this that I was more interested in getting color next to color than really having a believable uh, depiction of the child and the mother. Next slide. Matisse, bathers by the river in the early 1900s. I saw that Matisse was doing something very bold. He was using line to describe his figures, but he, he was also using line to just be line as pattern. And he wasn't trying to make his outlining of the figures all that correct. And he also was taking a lot of liberties with the skin color. And I, I just thought that showed an enormous amount of freedom that I sought after. Next slide. In um, somewhere along the line, 2018, I did this painting of people sitting around a table and it's all line. It's completely one color red that I did almost in one sitting, excuse the pun. Uh, but I, I found it very hard to follow through on this. I just, I tried to do more paintings like this, but they never turned out to be as actively improvisational as this one. Next slide. Here's one that I did, I think in 2019, it was in a show I had in London. I called it push pull and it was a figure 
and outlining some of the arms and legs coming in. I, I saw it as a figure being, being bothered by other people, but some of the viewers thought this was a figure being supported by other people. Next slide. I was, had in mind these Motherwell. Robert Motherwell did these paintings, big open series, blue with just a line and a great lots of orange and paying a lot of attention to the architecture of the rectangle. I thought they were handsome. And frankly, I thought it was enough. And I think he gave me permission to draw and to do fields, fields of color at the same time. Next slide. So this is a painting that's now up in New York. It's called Fever. And I used the blues and the oranges, the outlines, the big brush figures. Um, there's not of a believable setting. I don't know where they are. It could be kind of overhead. There's a hand reaching down, cradling the forehead of a person who's, who, who has a fever. Next slide. This painting is also in the exhibit. And um, I think it's a continuation of the idea of a person with limbs used almost as stripes. My, my show in London was actually called Legs and Stripes. You know, I would do these things and then it would be months and months afterwards that I would think about them and wonder where to take them and what they meant and if, and if, they, were, if they were useful or if they were understandable. And why did I do it? And I, I still look at this painting and think, what, what is happening to this man? Is he being attacked? Is he being supported? Is he being bothered? Next slide. This is called um, Mother's Lap. And it's perhaps where I got the idea of calling the show Mother Paintings. She, she's a mother who's kind of turned into a piece of furniture. She has two, two perhaps children on her lap and a third one waiting to be on her lap. Next slide. I used the image of people sitting on each other's laps. It was in the summer that I did this painting and the red one. It was full pandemic. There was a lot of anxiety about the future. I called this painting Fear of Dark. Dark was a, was a word being used by, by a lot of new, newscasters about being a dark time and there were gonna be dark times ahead. And as a painter, I thought that was interesting. I, I thought of darkness as mysterious and kind of wonderful, but I rethought it in this painting. It was the fear of dark, as Roosevelt said, the fear of fear itself that interested me. And I thought that during a pandemic, perhaps where you wanna be is on a lap, maybe your mother's lap. You wanted solace and comfort. Next slide. This is a, a short little sketch that might have started the whole lap series. I think it almost came up by mistake by not drawing two people very correctly and it looked like they were sitting on each other's lap so I so I realized that might be an interesting idea to explore. Next slide. This, this painting is called Mother Joins the Circus. I know, you wanna know why. 
why the mother is joining the circus and why I did this painting, which, which I'm looking forward to talking about a little more later on. I, I have some reason. Next slide. Uh, a child sitting on a mother's lap. Um, I call this painting motherhood. It's perhaps a kind of alternative family. Nancy gave me that phrase, asked me, are you interested in alternative family? I think I am. I think I'm interested in alternative everything. Gender spectrums, maybe. Next slide. This is called, um, well, I had, to I had to change the title so many times. I don't know what it's called. I think it's called guest at dinner or dinner party. There, I wanted, I was gonna call it the uninvited guest, but my very wise gallery told me that wasn't, why was this big purple man, woman, not invited that I was raising some questions and maybe I wasn't prepared to answer. Them. So this is uh, the people around a table all gathered and somebody being left out of the gathering, but perhaps about to join. Next slide. This is called bus stop. And I think I will always think of this painting as for its color and for the fact that I piled up broad stripes behind it. And then when I did that, I realized the painting was done visually for me. Next slide. This is called Upsetting Times. And I pulled in a horizontal figure that was supposed to be going across the top. But I needed the figure to go in that space between the two other figures. So you see, I, I'm describing a lot of formal decisions. And after I make the decisions, I think a little bit about how the painting looks and, and what the meaning might be. So this is called Upsetting Times. Next slide. This painting is called Two Mothers. Two Mothers and a Guy. Next slide. This is the smallest painting in the show. It's um, 48 inches and it harks back to a lot of my swimmer, swimmer series that were in very atmospheric grounds. Next slide. I think that's, that's the um, end of my showing you the paintings in my show and, and so on. And um, Nancy had some questions and we'll, I'll continue to show this, these images. So, um, Kathy, would you like me to jump in here? Because I, of course, I do have some questions. No, I, I jump in anywhere you want. And are there more images that you'd like to, to show while we're talking or before we begin our conversation? No, no I, I, I'm, I'm finished with the images. Um, thank you for, um, it's just such a pleasure to, um, I, I had run through them and, um, I know I promised that I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't uh, throw in any surprises in my questions, but one thing I was struck by as you were talking, and I won't dwell on this, is um, how wonderfully you um, exploit or take, um, take further surprises that you find in the course of making your work. Um, so, uh, and how um, productive that has been um, for the recent paintings and I think for the earlier ones as well. But where I, where we, where we um, did talk about beginning is with the question of scale in your work and, and 
the figures having gotten bigger and um, so big, in fact, that many of them don't actually fit inside the canvas and there are arms and legs that, you know, sort of stand for bodies that are um, kind of off screen. And I, you know, I know from watching a talk that you gave um, um, just pre-pandemic, just at the very beginning of all this excitement and pain um, about, you know, showing how that, um, painting of the woman with all the breasts, I think it was that one was made. And what struck me about it was that those great Let, big- Let's go to that image. Let's go to that one. Um, if, if that's possible. If you could click through the slides. That would be Henry. Is my slide master? Yes, we should be pulling them up right now. Okay, thank you, Henry. Of course. Could you just describe the painting again to it's, help out? It's pink. Just keep right. clicking and I'll tell you when to stop. Great, right. we'll start from the beginning. It's a, hard, it's a big horizontal painting. There yeah. we go. Go back. The previous one. Yeah. So you were talking about putting this painting together or having this painting emerge. And it, it, um, it grew from, this was miraculous to, to see you demonstrate. It grew from a series of horizontal figures um, that went away and were replaced. And here we get to the push pull um, painting. It, they were replaced by a series of kind of rectangular and square fields of color that then became vertical figures. Um, so while we are watching really, really engrossing interpersonal drama, or at least interpersonal experience take place on canvas, we're also watching um, a completely formal um, set of decisions take place. So that's a really, really long way of asking you, Kathy, whether you would like to talk about scale in your current paintings. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I thought you were going to say, that's a really, really long way to make a painting. <laughs> and it was. It was. Um, you mean, how did I get make the figures bigger? Why did I do that? Yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Every, every artist gets bigger and bigger. They do these monstrously huge paintings. Someone told me if you move to New York, you've got to do huge work. Um, I, I think, it, again, it was a visual decision. You know, I heard Susan Precon give a, an artist talk and someone asked her a question and she said, very simply, all my decisions are visual. Susan Freecon being an abstract painter, but I'll never forget that she said that all my decisions are visual. And how true that is. Um, Nancy's right. This pink painting started out with three horizontal figures flying through the air but it was too blank. I needed something behind them. So I put chunks of color, maybe like plant, like planets or something. But I saw immediately that I needed more behind and I made them into figures walking behind her, upright figures. Now that was a visual decision because I felt I had too much horizontal. And I took out the other two people and I made this woman all orange, which means she was naked. Mm -hmm. And I gave her breasts. I gave her a lot of breasts with milk coming out of them. And that's why you see these, <laughs> these spikes of white. What, how did you describe that? Maybe we could, Fast forward, if you could go almost to the end of this slide about, about 28 or something. It's kind of nice to go through all the paintings anyway. Who cares?
one after this. There we go. Yeah. So there's the painting. And um, Nancy wrote, I find the horizontal woman, the woman fountaining milk from half a dozen breasts, like the wolf who suckled Romulus and Remus, especially funny. And then she said, are they meant to be funny? <laughs> and, and I thought, oh, I'd really like to answer that question because <clears throat> I, I don't know if I mean it to be funny, but I definitely saw this was pretty odd. And I could hear my father laughing, chuckling to himself in my studio, my father who's not alive anymore. But he, he, he loved to do strange things and then laugh. It was infectious. Um, I, I needed the woman to be like that. I needed the figures to reach the top of the canvas, like, like stripes. I, I needed it. And that's the way I, way I, why I did it. And, and what's been so wonderful is hearing my viewers try and interpret this painting. And I think they remember it as a pink painting or they remember it as the, as the woman floating through it. <laughs> so the answer is yes, meant to be funny or at least meant to give us um, a license to laugh a little bit. Um, Listen, I didn't mean it to be funny. Okay. It, it happened. And I realized, I would say it was odd. It was odd. And I, and I dreaded having, having to explain why I did this and whether, and whether the person was me. And you know, with, without, without pressing you on, on that question of whether the woman is you, um, but thinking also about Mother Joins um, the Circus, it, it, which um, seems a kind of reluctant decision. She's being sort of hauled off again horizontally and she's blue. And I'm, you know, I have been thinking about your work over the past period of time and how often there are um, puns and, and double meanings in um, both the elements of your painting and sometimes the titles and the way you describe them as well. And um, let's see that, that painting, Mother Joins the Circuit. It's, it's back a little bit. And the question brings us back to your yeah. title, that one. Uh, yeah. There, she's, so here's mother joining the circus. Um, but unlike the, you know, unlike the mother who is, you know, so super productive of milk, um, this mother seems a little with, you know, withholding and on, you know, not willing. So, I mean, one thing that, you know, that we're talking about is that while every decision is a visual decision, there's also a lot going on that has to do um, with people, with story, with um, relationships. And so, um, You've made father paintings, you know, there are children in, or at least implicit children in your paintings, all the laps, the lap sitting, um, you are a mother. Um, of course, we all have mothers too. Um, motherhood is a big thing. Um, there are motherships in some of your paintings. So I just wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about why you call this particular show at this particular moment, the mother paintings show. I know it, it's, it's a, it's a big uh, scope to say mother paintings. Um, I was really searching for a title and I wanted to call the show fear of dark, 
Mm -hmm. But my wise gallery mentors said, don't call it that. Um, you'll, you'll get into a lot of areas that, that maybe you don't want to get into. Um, and then, and I think I realized as the, as the paintings were coming together as a group that a lot of them had mother figures in them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I feel one thing that happened during the pandemic is that we look to our, our state as a mother. We, we were, mm -hmm. I was tuned to the news. Cuomo was being a big mother and telling us how many people had COVID and whether we should wear masks. I mean, we were really directed by an all encompassing, almost maternal figure who we thought should be taking care of us. And when they didn't take care of us, there was a lot of criticism. That I think we thought our political leaders should uh, mother us in a way. I think I might get in trouble for saying that. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, I thought that um, we needed a mother during now, during this pandemic, which is not over. And this painting happened almost by mistake. But you know, uh, you're right, Nancy. I, <laughs> uh, there are things that happen as I paint that surprised me. And then that gives me an idea of, of what the painting is or what to do or what to erase or the whole thing. Um, and this Mother Joins the Circus was the name of a show I had in April in Portland, Oregon at Adams and Ullman. And, and again, it was default title because I wanted to call the uh, show Circus People. And Amy Adams said, no, don't do that. That's like circus people, you might, the circus people might take offense <laughs> at my paintings. So uh, I said, well, how about mother joins the circus? And she said, oh, okay. <laughs> and, after I had titled my show that, I really agonized over what the hell I meant. And I finally got to the place where we all have a mother and we don't want her to join the circus because basically that means she kind of flipped out. You run away and join the circus it means you, you're, you're not in the norm. And I realized that that's uh, what my children, my two children thought I did when I became an artist. They were already school age when, when this development happened. And, and I, think they, um, I think they thought it was kind of a crazy move and that my artist friends were crazy and that I was gonna go in that direction. And, and I love, I love the art world's nuttiness. I, I love all of our queerness, our weirdness. It's, it's just been endlessly fascinating to me. So I'm celebrating that as well as commenting on it. it it's a world that I cherish and that I want to belong to and that I, and that I feel has helped me enormously to, to grow as a person, this circus, this so, circus and the circus people. So the circus um, could be another way of thinking about the art world, which um, I'm not saying that in a disparaging way. I think we all sometimes um, feel that the art world at its best is, is a circus and more seriously, um, and especially, um, in a year like this one, when we don't have um, that sense of community that we um, usually have such conflicted feelings about, about, but basically feel what a wonderful thing 
being involved in the arts is because of the community that it creates, the family that it creates. Um, so the question I have in my mind goes in, in sort of two directions right now. And um, one is um, to do with alternative kinds of family, which can include the art community as a family, as, um, as being really quite powerfully mutually supportive in many ways. And um, also to alternative families in terms of queering the idea of family, of, of families headed by same sex partners and, um, and just to take this full circle, um, you have twins. And so, you know, every painting with like crowded laps makes me think having twins, having two children at once is a big deal. You never have to laugh. Let's, let's go to a picture. I think it's at the very end of this. And and I will show my mother. Ah, <laughs> this, these are my mother credentials. This this was taken in 1968. And I had Arthur and Laura. That's what I looked like in 1968. Pretty darn good. That is very impressive. So, you know, first I want to say it is, um, I think, very bold to include not just the questions of motherhood and parenthood in painting, which puts you at risk of being in that realm where people start to worry about sentiment, but especially putting children in your painting and having that um, be a kind of central um, theme in the current show. But I kind of also want to go back to the painting fever because it does, um, it's such a beautiful painting, but it also is such a kind of powerful image of um, people taking care of each other there. Um, and, you know, in a number of different ways, but that, you know, the, the, the figure in the center with this sort of burning hot head, burning hot forehead, and you know the the tenderness with which the person coming down from above is, you know, while is is tending to him, while or her, while um, all of these decisions I know are about constructing um, a composition, so. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've talked about COVID. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about um, alternative families and how they um, are motivations for your work or are pictured in your work? I don't, I don't know so much that they're, that they're motivations as much as um, possibilities um, that, that I'm letting myself I'm letting those characters come into my work. Nancy, I, I love to hear you talk about my work. It makes me feel really understood. And that is a great feeling, especially when I've lived through a lot of people, including my grandson recently saying, Grand Calf, I don't really get what you're doing <laughs> in your paintings. And, and I know that that's most of the world. So this is, this is a really wonderful, wonderful to hear. And, uh, and I love that you said that, that the decisions were, I don't know how you put it, but anyway, you're, you're recognizing that there's a meaning to this, but also that, that, I was making decisions as an abstract painter might do it. Yeah, well, you know, there was an article um, about Rose Wiley in the New York Times today, which, which I read avidly because she's so interesting to me. And she said, the subject of a work doesn't matter. What matters is how she paints it. I guess the person who wrote the article. What matters is how she paints it. The subject of a work doesn't matter. You know, that is an incredibly radical thing to say 
in this time of figurative painting when there's so much emphasis on identity and what the subject of the work is and people aren't talking about how they're painted. And, and I, as a painter, love to go to the area of how the paint is put on and what the colors are and if the colors are good and if it's tight or loose or all that kind of stuff. Which um, you do in a great variety of ways. First of all, thank you, I'm humbled and um, embarrassed. And um, maybe for that reason, kind of want to retreat a little bit to a discussion that we sort of you touched on in the, in the presentation at the beginning, which is about connections to other artists. And it, it, was, it was so good to see Matisse in, in that discussion and also Susan Rothenberg. And I, I know you've made reference in other um, interviews and, and, and talks to a whole range of, of artists that you look at. I mean, that is, um, that is part of how art works and it's part of being part of a community. Um, what I loved about the Matisse connection, um, and this goes to the trajectory of your work as a whole from paintings that were very floaty and you know had figures immersed in these seas that could be um, oxygen, that could be deep space, that could be ocean water. Um, and could, now they become- Could you scroll through those, those earlier images, Matisse and the figures in the water? Sorry, Nancy. Nope. It's good to see the work. And um, so here, um, I know this isn't long ago, but it's, it's a way that you have um, depicted figures that more or less as ciphers, you know, as, as sort of mm -hmm. indications rather than full figures. Um, and there, there are examples where the figures are even smaller in this um, great big C. And, Yet by referring to Matisse and, you know, we could like plug Cezanne in there too and his bathers, you've got bodies that are like- Matisse, can you get to, to Matisse? So I think it's a little sooner. There are bodies that are out of the water. Um, it's true of the Rothenberg too. No, so I guess it's for- Oh, there. right. Um, Matisse you know, is called Bathers by the River. Bathers by the River. You know, and of course, when a body comes out of the water, it feels especially kind of big, cold, and wet, um, not buoyant anymore. So here, you know, here are um, figures that are um, in this transparent medium. And that's an example of, I think, of your discussion of transparency as being a good example of using words in a number of different ways that the medium is transparent um, to the figures and also transparent to um, the subject at hand. And paint can be, can be considered the only medium that really substantially matters in all of your work. These are all figures born in paint, but so, so there's, you know, there's the Cezanne, sorry, there's the Matisse and I'm speculating about Cezanne and other substantial. Let's, um, let's, let's look at the Matisse. There. Yes. Yay, okay. So very substantial figures. Also, you know, sort of a little bit too big on the left for the size of the very substantial canvas. And um, then, you know, there are other kinds of um, connections you make to painters like um, Nicole Eisenman, for instance, that are to do much more with figures in social interaction. And um, there I think of the dinner parties, there are a couple that you've included um, in this. Let, let's see the red line dinner party. There. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I know John Yao talked about this as, as a last supper. Um, 
and because there's there are 12 figures um 12 seated eaters and there's one chair empty so um and he had a whole explanation so i mean i'm kind of curious what your reaction to that um association is but also you know between Matisse and Nicole Eisenman, for instance, um, is there a balance of importance to you at the moment? Are there people who just seem for now particularly important to you? Oh gosh, yes. Um, a friend of mine who's a writer was asking all of us who were sitting around her why, why we read. She said, what are the reasons you read? And we sort of brought up some things. And then she said, well, I read for plunder. <laughs> and it was so shocking. She said she read to see what other people were doing so she could do it. And, and I'm very attached to Instagram and going online and, and going to art shows and going to museums because I, I, exactly, plunder. I, I want to see how someone else has struggled with how to paint a figure or how to paint a painting or how to talk about social change, not talk about social change, how to do a soulful painting, how to do a readable painting. Um, and, and I depend on all that. I think that's why I live in New York City, because it's, I mean, in, in April, it was the epicenter of COVID germs. But right now, I think it's the epicenter of great art ideas. The museum, museums are all in flower. And it's just such an exciting atmosphere to be an artist in and to plunder. Yeah. Um, yes, and to do it with enthusiasm. That's and and with acknowledgement is um, is a special thing. So I have a couple more questions. Um, maybe we should take some guidance on when we should open this up to the rest of the folks out there. Well, feel free to take your time, Nancy and Kathy. But let, let's go. Let's go to the very end. There are just two images or a couple of images at the very end that we haven't even seen because of okay it was supposed to help uh, us know what to say air go up a little oops air um this is this was in the new york times it was a review by will heinrich of Claire Grill. <clears throat> and he quotes her as saying, these paintings aren't about grief or loss or anything really, she writes, but they've been made in it and with it. She's talking about the pandemic. I just thought that was such an honest statement to say, <laughs> your work isn't about anything really. I, I'm so tempted to say that sometimes. <laughs> but they've been made in it and with it. That seems so important. How could any one of us, writers, poets, whatever we're doing, we've been, it's been made in a global pandemic and with it. And inevitably that impacts the work in a mysterious way. I, I still don't know how to talk about it. And then this last one under it, this, Nancy's point about the scale of the figures in relation to the space around them. I thought this was a good example because this really is a, I made a field of color. It, it could be a sky and the figures are really ciphers. And, and I've made many paintings like this. And I think Nancy, you wanted to know why why I stopped doing this and made them the way they are in this show. And I don't know if I can answer that or that I might go back to doing this back or I might, I might 
do some more paintings like this. And this sense of being immersed in, a, you know, a medium that's not easily negotiated is something that you can feel even in the bigger figured paintings as well. So it's, I don't see it as like an irreversible progression. I see it as part of, um, part of a process. Um, I think it might be nice to go back to, go back a couple of images to the two paint, yeah, before that, um, there. Um, protect your inner life. So that's my last question to you, Kathy. What protects your inner life? How do you do that? Well, I think I did these scruffy little talismans which have been hanging up in my studio for the past year because I wanted to protect my inner life because I felt that the um, very theatrical drama of our political situation, our election, our um, protests, and our pandemic were usurping everything, the conversations, what we thought about. For the first time, uh, my spouse, Jane, and I watched the news religiously, and I felt it was just taking over everything. And as artists, we needed an inner life. We needed imaginations. And, and reacting to the headlines was dangerous, I thought. I'm gonna get in trouble for saying that. But that's what I, why I did these, these little, my own protests. Yeah, <laughs> it's important. It needs, yeah. It does need protection. So um, what do you think? Yeah, but let's- There are only not 99 questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's, let's do that then. All right, great. Thank you so much, Kathy and Nancy. It was lovely to hear you two in conversation. Um, yes, we do have a bucket load of questions um, to get through. So, uh, we are going to head over to Rose Marasco for our first question. You should be able to unmute yourself, Rose. Yes. Henry, could, could you keep flicking through these? Um, one thing that bugs me is when I have to look at an image too long. For sure. I'll pull up the slides and just run through them. Yeah. All right. And Rose, you should be unmuted now if you'd like to ask your question. Yes, thank you. Hi, Rose. Yeah. Hi. So lovely to uh, hear you talk about the new work because I won't get to see it, but I'm enjoying looking at it on all the ways that we can. Um, and I, I always love your hum hum humor, you know that. I've been on the receiving end of it for couple decades so um, I think that's a, a lovely part of your work and I know that it does come from your family they're all jokesters gotta watch out <laughs> um, what I noticed about this new work like this particular piece that we're looking at now and also the one entitled fever I don't know the names of all of them but uh, this example and fever it's almost like you're, you're using the edges in a new way, it seems to me, because things just go off. And even like uh, some of them could be almost turned upside down and, and, and still be working, you know? Uh, I just find that to be very expansive. Um, and and the, the field of these is very open and broad. Yes, the figures are like upside down even. And, and I heard you talk, uh, maybe it was on Instagram, you, you, that you changed these sections. I love that you left those. They have a ease about them. They're, they feel very spontaneous. They feel very direct and they're very bold. Uh, but I, I just, I love the movement in them that you're getting by using the edges and basically, uh, 
kind of having us enjoy this experience with you. The, the narrative quality, the, the timing that that involves. I mean, you, you've always been good on that. Like it's a, it's a moment that you capture uh, with whatever's going on. Um, so that it has an implied narrative. You know, you talk about literature and, and, and reading. Of course, we love stories. Stories keep us going. And we've all had to tell ourselves a story in this time period. Uh, so now uh, I'm zooming off like we're talking all by ourselves. So I'll stop. And I, I wondered if you might be able to comment on that spatial quality and, and maybe moving, moving more around the painting and not seeing it as peering into a window so much, but as an active, and this figure too, I, I don't care who it is, or it's a man or a woman or what. Or was that a deliberate choice in, in your? Rose Marasco is a photographer who loves windows. <laughs> and, oh, and that's one thing I love. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. um, I love what you said. And, and I, I just think I'll let that stand. I, I think some of the reasons that these, this new, these new paintings look a little different mm -hmm is because um, Sarah Brayman and Phil Grauer worked with me. They're both partners at Canada and they had an agenda. I think they wanted this body of work to be a new body of work and to show that I, that I had d discovered new things. And I, I don't wanna say progress, but um, they were an enormous help in um, the struggle I was having because I made a lot of paintings and they were really good editors and in the final stretch, really helpful in uh, installing a show. The big room of the show, when I stood back and looked at it, I thought, oh, I see, I see what I'm doing, <laughs> which was a great feeling. Um, well, I think I, I, I think I flipped around. I did all sorts of paintings that wouldn't have um, fit in this show, and they helped me avoid that. Those, hmm. which was kind of disheartening a lot of times, because they'd throw a no, not that, no, not that one, not that one. Um, and I'm saying this because I think there are other artists listening that how much I've had to edit out of what I'm doing in order to have a show. Thanks, Rose. Okay, thank you. I'd like to publicly say one more thing. I'm glad you're getting that nurturing because those of us who've known you, and I'm sure there's a lot of people here, know that you've nurtured so many artists throughout your career. And I just want to commend you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose, for the question. Um, we're now going to move over to a question from Linda Thomas. I can read it on your behalf, but you should be able to unmute if you'd like to ask it. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, um, you left a question in the chat uh, asking about, asking Kathy if she has a personal lexicon of figural images or color choices that you use repeatedly and that have become emblematic for you. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, you're, you're asking me something that is almost secondhand, you know, like asking a tennis player how they serve a ball or something, because I, I'm not, I know in this painting we're looking at the, um, something interesting just happened to that painting, but the, the big figure on the right um, was the first thing that happened. And this figure was at the bottom of the painting. 
And then when I turned the painting vertically so that it was a standing figure, the figure had to be looking at something. And what was there wasn't that interesting to me. And I, and I did think, ah, yes, people sitting around a table, which is, which is something I like to do because it evokes community, gatherings, um, th things that I like. So I made three different tables, which happened to be full of light. I think that was because of the, an earlier painting under it. Um, yes, I do. You know, sometimes I make lists and stuff. I don't make sketches, but I make lists of things that I, that I want to do. And then I never read the list. <laughs> but thank you for asking me that. And thank you for the question, Linda. We actually, speaking of earlier iterations of paintings, just got a question in the chat from Emily Nam. I'm inviting you to unmute yourself, but I can also read your question on your behalf. Hi, Kathy. Sorry, my video isn't working at the moment, but my question is, when you're working, are you determined to maintain an idea or a focus for the image? Or for example, with the father's painting, does the image more often tend to drive its own metaphor, which reveals itself to you over time? And how do you sort of balance those convictions within yourself when you're making? Well, it's pretty interesting to have both going at once, as you suggested. Um, revealing itself over time is great. And if it doesn't reveal itself over time, then, then I'm, I lose interest in the painting. That, that father's painting is so mysterious that I, I can still come back to it and talk about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for the question. And we have a similar question from someone called iPhone in the chat. Um, I'm going to unmute you, um, but I'm also happy to read your question on your behalf. All right. Hi, Kathy, it's Richard Jacobs, how are you? Hello, Richard. So, um, this is something that I think about a lot with your work. Um, it appears that the process of the painting dictates the content. And often the narrative doesn't reveal itself for a long time after the work is finished, if ever at all. Um, does showing the work in galleries, in museums, does it allow your evolving narratives, you know, your personal narratives and the paintings to be influenced by other people's reactions? And in other words, are the narratives only revealed after your work is digested by your audience? Yes. Yes, it is. And often my audience is Facebook, especially during the pandemic, not Facebook, Instagram. Um, I posted an image of Mother Joins the Circus on Instagram because I thought it was kind of a funny painting. I didn't think it would be part of my show or it would be an important painting, but there was a lot of people um, read something into it. And, and we had fun going back and forth about it. And that's when I realized that this, this painting had some kind of power to it. So it, it, I, I depend on my viewers a lot, a whole lot. Well, it's a great relationship and I'm happy to be part of it and I know everyone else is. Oh, thank you, Richard. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm gonna see you later this summer. I hope so. <laughs> thank you for the question, Richard. Um, and uh, we have a question from Elizabeth Awalt about um, the fear of waves painting. You should be able to unmute yourself and I can also ask a question on your behalf. Um, 
We can't hear you, Elizabeth. Oh, hi. Hi. There you go. Yeah. Um, I guess, hi, Kathy. These are so- Hey, exciting. Elizabeth. How are you? These are so exciting. Um, I, I wondered, you said something about this painting being one of the, uh, uh, almost a hallmark painting in that a lot of people responded to it. Um, something that I interpreted as meaning, you know, this was a beginning of, of um, you know, your audience expanding. And, and I wondered if you know why have any idea about that? Well, one thing about this painting is it was regarded as a summer painting, like, oh, and a couple of magazines asked to print it during the summer after, after it was shown as a great example of people enjoying the summer and swimming and having fun at the beach. And, and even though I called it fear of waves, that kind of disappeared as an idea. But when I see this painting now during this 2020, I, I see it totally differently. It's, it's, not, it's not a happy, jolly paint, painting. It's about something on the horizon that, that we're, that we're petrified of. It's coming and we can't stop it. And it's of nature. It's the natural world being itself, being waves. And that's why I say, I think the painting has now become about fear. Mm -hmm. So um, I think unwittingly, I made a painting that could be seen on a lot of different levels. It went from summer frolicking to uh, kind of portentous. <laughs> and you know, Elizabeth owns a painting of mine that I posted on Instagram. Weren't you amazed at the reaction to that painting? I was, and I was, I was so proud that I, I owned it because a bunch of people wanted to buy it. <laughs> well. It was, it was a person looking out to see. It was rather innocent, innocent subject, almost a cliche. But in, in this day and age, we're, we're looking forward. We we're, we're just want to know what's going to happen. Well, there was also a tsunami happening around that time, I wonder. The painting. Yeah, we're looking that's at. right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question, Elizabeth. Um, we're now going to move to Diane Englander. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi. Hi, Kathy. How are you? Hey, Diane. So earlier, Kathy, you referred to um, questions you asked yourself as you were painting. Um, and one of them was wondering whether the painting or the paintings would be understandable. Uh, so I just wondered if you could say something more about what you mean by understandable. Well, I feel that we're in the business of communicating, communicating visually. And um, I think if you're not doing that, that you're failing. And so um, one thing I take issue with is the labels on the wall that you have to read in order to get what you're looking at. Yeah. Um, and often it's pretty exciting once you read the label, but, <laughs> but, but looking, at, looking at a lot of the art up now or some of the art up now is it's just confounding to me what this is about. And there's some secret code, there's some reference is something that stands for something and it's not coming across visually or I'm too stupid to get it. And I don't like that feeling. Um, and so do you want your, your viewers to have the understanding that you feel you have when you look at the painting or do you have a um, more open hope that 
they'll find some meaning, uh, perhaps their own in looking at it. The open hope is there. Okay. Thank you. Open hope. I'm going to do a little sign. Yeah, I <laughs> know. It's a good concept. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Diane. And um, we're now going to move over to a question from G.E. Schwartz. You should be able to unmute. Keep, keep clicking through these um, images. Yes. Yes, thank you. I, I, uh, there are so many questions today that, uh, that probably could be also asked. I, I hope we get to some of those as well. But, but my question really is, uh, that does, and it almost goes, it almost what you just said about open hope and, and meaning and things. Does painting have to be a vehicle for yearning for unveiled clarity? <laughs> oh, I'm going to say yes. Okay. <laughs> totally yes. <laughs> You know, I, I was giving a talk earlier this year and one of the questions was, is it bad to do a, to do a tight painting? And I realized I must have gone really overboard about big brushes and slapping the paint on. And this artist thought, is it bad to do a tight painting? And I had to backtrack on that. So on your question, are you, are you asking me that because of all the things I've said today? Well, I was thinking in general of, of you know, of the way that uh, even poets work in these kind of things and stuff. And, uh, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, uh, it, do, does it have to be that search or is it just something that can just be that, um, you know, that uh, just expresses the, uh, the unveiled clarity or, or maybe the cloud of unknowing or that kind of thing, you know? Well, you know, the great thing about these lunchtime conversations is that the Brooklyn Rail gives two people a chance to have a platform and, and spit forth their beliefs. And my, my bias is that yearning, finding, searching is, is um, really important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And um, we're now going to go to a question from Melora. You should be able to unmute yourself. And again, I can read your question on your behalf. Okay. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Keep flicking through those images. Oh, gosh. Oh, I love these images so much. And I. Uh, trying to work my computer. What was my question? Was um, actually I'm looking for my question. Yeah, it, it was about um, oh, yeah. I'm curious. Inner life. Yeah, I'm curious how Kat, how you hi Kathy hi um, <laughs> yeah the the paintings um, you know the paintings speak so clearly. To, so much they say so much and and then there's the other thing of you talking about them and I'm really interested in that dual that what if you call it a duality i don't know but, but as an intuitive painter i just was you know and then seeing your clear uh piece about your inner protecting your inner life um i was interested in the you know how do you do that while you're talking in these forums and sometimes you know the academic language and it just I get a I have an issue with that sometimes and I just wondered if you do you don't seem to <laughs> but I guess I'm I I did not go to art school undergraduate art school and when I finally got an MFA I was in my 40s right so um I was already trying to talk about art before I learned the academic language. So it wasn't even a possibility with me. And I, and I talk about that, about figures. I, I didn't go to lots and lots of foundation courses. I didn't have a lot of life drawing classes. Maybe that's very evident. And um, 
As far as the academic language, well, I think, I think you can guess how I feel about that. I, I like, um, I'm gonna quote from, from Rose Wiley again. She says, she liked something, she said, very direct and clear and non-arty. It's honest. And the form often has a line around the edge. So um, non-arty is something I like. And thank you for letting me be able to say that, Melora. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. I, I, the, the color to me is so emotional. I just wanted to say that. I, I don't understand why more artists don't use color. It's a great tool. And, um, and I, I never learned it. I think I just over the years um, realized that I liked it. <laughs> it was a hard thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melora. And on that note of not enough, enough other artists using color, uh, we have a question from Ellen. You should be able to unmute. Which question is it? Because I asked two questions. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the one about what qualities do you look for in your paintings and others? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say my that my name is spelled wrong. It's Elena, not Ellen. But oh, I wanted to. That's okay. It's I can't correct it. But um, Kathy, did you ever realize that the the waves in your painting in that big painting are breaking going out to sea rather than into the beach? <laughs> Let's take a look at that painting. That's a pretty big mistake. No, it, it makes it very interesting yeah, it psychologically. Because um, they're breaking think, to the left, think, right? No, I think of waves as, as being kind of straight and then they bump up into the air and they curl over. Mm -hmm. and but aren't they moving to the left? They're moving to my left, yes. So that's- it, These people are running towards the beach. If they keep running, they're gonna go up into the sand. Oh, I see, uh-huh. Anyway. That's the way it, it happens in Maine. Uh-huh. <laughs> Different so from other people. Sand, sand, shallow water, waves. Uh-huh. Because it looks like the, the waves are chasing the people out to sea in a way. That's even more terrifying. Yeah, it is. So I want I wanted to ask you basically as a painter, um, what are what are the qualities that you look for um, when you in your own work and in other people's work that you find exciting that you want that you want to go after? Um, I like direct work, and I wish people, I wish writers would. Um, use some word other than uh, outsider. I've been called self-taught, naive, and faux naive, which I, which I don't like at all. And, and I've asked, even asked it to be changed. Please, please don't say that. <laughs> um, And, and so I've searched for another way to describe work like mine, which is almost folk art or the way children, children draw sometimes. I, I don't like childish. I think childlike is great. Um, I'm getting a little more confident about the kind of artist I am. I think that's one of my biggest struggles has been to own own up to the way I I paint and draw, and um, yeah, that this is this is who I am, and I'm pushing eighty years old, so 
it's taken a while. It's taken a while to get here. Did I say enough, Elena? Sure, I can ask you later. <laughs> um, you. Yeah. Sorry, no, go ahead. No, I wasn't gonna say anything else. All right, <laughs> well, thank you so much for asking your question. And I, I'm just noticing that Carol Saft has her hand raised and she left a question in the chat earlier. So I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so Kathy, I wanted to thank you for not using the word haptic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what it means. <laughs> That's okay. People who are academic in the audience, they'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. And then the other thing is the painting with the man standing in the foreground and then the three tables with yeah, let's lots take a of look at that. Let's yeah, yeah, that. yeah. I'm sure you can find it really easily now. Yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of it. I don't either. I think it's called <laughs> Guess. Guess. <laughs> All right. Yes, at the dinner party, something like that. Okay, so I'm thinking of the photo that you posted of Andre, your brother Andre. Yeah. In that in that dress. Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that image still in your mind? It was very important when you posted it. That's a good question, Carol, because it's been pointed out to me by my. Yeah sister-in-law who was yeah to andre yeah and, yeah and my sister that this yeah. figure looks like my older brother yeah who died a year ago yeah I think that, so, was, I, that was almost subconscious yeah and also uh i admire the fact that a lot of your choices are subconscious and to me uh i feel like there's a real truth in working that way. And I, I wanted to say that. God, I that, hope so. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, I wanna say that. And you're, you're so self-effacing when people, uh, they border a line of a kind of uh, poking that would make you defend something, but you're really working with your own truths. Oh, thank you, Carol. Talk to you later. <laughs> Talk to you later. <laughs> Thank you, Carol, for the question. I can totally second all of your compliments, Kathy. Um, we are going to go to EJ Hauser, and then after her, we will conclude with a final remark from our publisher and editor, Fong Bui. Hi, Kathy. EJ, I have missed you so much. Oh my God, you. I miss you. I miss you too. So my question kind of was talked about, but um, maybe I can ask it a different way, which is um, this idea about protecting your inner life and then also being an artist who uses that inner life to make your broadcast. Um, I guess I was wondering, you know, is that painting, is it a reminder for you? Is it a, um, is it a reminder for other artists or just other people in general or all of us? And I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that, about the notion of protecting one's inner life, but also being generous like you are simultaneously with it. Well, I don't think protecting one's inner life um, precludes talking about it. And, and here I get to say how important I think it is. And you know, you and I have heard lots of artists who aren't mentioning that at all. They're, they're mentioning the big topics that are on the stage now, social justice and grievances. And, um, and actually I was asked to put a painting or put an artwork in a show in response to what was going on publicly in the world. And I thought, whoa, I can't do that. And then I made myself think about 
what I thought was important. And then, and I made, I made that little painting that said, protect your inner life. And I never put it in the show because I knew it, that's not what they wanted from me. They, they wanted um, a socially aware statement. Which is important. It's just that I'm not doing it. You know, I think artists um, are sort of being bamboozled into thinking that their worth is going to be if they do something to change the world, if they can do something about climate change and that affects the policy or something. I think that the value of artists is their individuality and their, um, their queerness. Their, uh, it's just being themselves the way Andy Warhol really changed the course of art, what art was. He introduced commercial art. He introduced um, doing a portrait from um, those photograph booths. I mean, he he was bold. He and and we still remember him. He's still important. And it it was the example of his whole life that uh, we remember. He he didn't talk about AIDS or homosexuality or uh, Black Lives Matter anything to do with that. He was. He was a very unique person. And that is what I think our value is. If we, if we can find that. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we um, live in a time where um, things are kind of changing so quickly that we get an opportunity to evolve into lots of things. You know, I, I'm, I'm always a champion of the amphibian idea. <laughs> yes. More paintings about amphibians. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kathy. I miss you. We're going to see each other soon over the rainbow. Thank you, EJ, for the question and thanks for joining us. Um, I am going to stop screen sharing and we are going to hear from Fong now. You should be able to turn on your mic, Fong. How do I get rid of this picture? Which picture? I could get green. it. Green. I want to see the people, not the uh, yeah. images. Everybody? No, I can't see them. OK. Um, I, I think you might be on your slideshow. Maybe you need to change screens to the Zoom window. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not being given the opportunity. Ah, okay, got it. You get it, Kathy? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Even though it's been super slow here and there, technical difficulty, everybody spoke so eloquently. And thank you to Nancy, propin question, Kathy. And uh, I don't know what to say really. We know each other so long and it's just delightful to see how you come to your incredible fruition in the last five years, six years particularly. And I love what um, Henry saying earlier when he was introducing question from the audience where he said, we have buckets of, of questions which compel me to say exactly what it is about your work, Kathy. You, you pose is you propose so many buckets of questions as a painter. And I think that's what art does, is to ask questions. We leave solution answer for the politician, the business people. As artists, that's what we do. We pose questions. And I can't help but think in, in was it in October 78 when John Pope the second Remember the Pope, the first Polish Pope, when he came, it was a big deal in television. He spoke at St. 
Peter, Peter in Rome, where he say, be not afraid. That was, I remember super well. And I think that's what Kathy's work is about. She's not afraid of anything. And that condition, be not afraid, require constant tuning in. Even during the pandemic, Kathy is so active online on social media. She was saying it not long ago. She go out and she see nothing escapes her. She pay attention to everything. Alertness, constant alertness. In order to, to pose questions, you have to be constantly tuning in. And, and Kathy does it with such conviction, with sense of curiosity and enthusiasm. That's a beauty for me. And uh, concerning about aesthetic, you know, we forgot about aesthetic, you know? Beauty is a big deal. You know, how one define one's own sense of aesthetic. Aesthetic require the constant alertness concerning to beauty in variety of ways, even in a different culture, we know that this concern about balance, equilibrium of form between form itself, themselves and other things. Uh, and, and it's important because it's the opposite of the word anesthetic, which is, you know, absence, loss of sensation, absence of awareness. It's a constant anesthesia. And that's not something we can subscribe to Kathy Bradford whatsoever. So thank you for being who you are, Kathy. And congratulations well, you, on the show. Can't wait to see the show. So that's the whole idea is <laughs> that now we heard what Kathy had been sharing with us about her work, her words of wisdom and Nancy, terrific, thoughtful questions and all of your coming together here. Uh, thank you for being here with us. So let's just go to see the show and celebrate Kathy Bradford. Hello, the great wonder. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Fong. Thank, thank you, Brooklyn Rail. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. It's thank, you Nick. thank you. Thanks, Fong. And yes, the show being at Canada Gallery called Mother Paintings, open until May 15th. So anyone in New York has no excuse. Um, thank you so much, Kathy and Nancy. And there really were bucket loads of questions. And I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. But thank you to those who asked questions in the chat. And the point is really to see those questions as a group of people. So thank you always for sharing them in the chat, even if we can't get to them in the Q&A. Um, at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And this time, I'm thrilled to welcome my fellow production assistant, Ty, to the stage. Um, the floor is yours, Ty. Hello. Uh, thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Nancy. And of course, Henry and Fong. Uh, this conversation has been so amazing. And it was really, really lovely to hear you talk about all of these works, Kathy. And I can't wait to see the show. Um, I'm going to be reading two Frank O'Hara poems today, uh, and we're going to start with Why I Am Not a Painter. <laughs> I am not a painter, I am a poet. Why? I think I would rather be a painter, but I am not. Well, for instance, Mike Goldberg is starting a painting. I drop in. Sit down and have a drink, he says. I drink. We drink. I look up. You have sardines in it. Yes, it needed something there. Oh, I go and the days go by and I drop in again. The painting is going on and I go and the days go by. I drop in, the painting is finished. Where's sardines? All that's left is just letters. It was too much, Mike says. But me, one day I am thinking of a color, orange. I write a line about orange. Pretty soon it is a whole page of words, not lines. Then another page. There should be so much more, not of orange, of words, of how terrible orange is and life. Days go by. It is even in prose. I am a real poet. My poem is finished and I haven't mentioned orange yet. It's 12 poems. I call it Oranges. And one day in a gallery, I see Mike's painting called Sardines. And then we're gonna read, Lana Turner has collapsed 
at, I believe, Kathy's request. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard. So it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. And suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ty. And again, a huge thank you to Nancy and Kathy. It's been a pleasure to hear you in conversation. And uh, I just can't express how much uh, you are my artistic hero, Kathy. <laughs> um, so at the, the Rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit dedicated to providing free and accessible criticism and community events. If you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent. And you should find a link in the chat with more information. And please join us on Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation between artist and educator Patty Chang and our very own Malvika Jolly. And I am now going to allow everyone to unmute themselves so you can say hello and goodbye on your way out. Thank Hello you and goodbye. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good work, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Painting is a two-way street. Sure <laughs> <laughs> is. Yes, so it. inspiring. <laughs> Hi, Richard. Hey, Carol. Heidi. Heidi. Hello, Heidi. Heidi. Hi, Fun. Heidi. Thank you, guys. Jab, Henry. <laughs> Thank <What's you>. the... <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Kathy. Thanks, Ty. Bye, Thank everybody. You. <laughs> Thank you for everyone. Does our hearts a world of good. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. Congrats, Kathy. Get some fun. I see you soon, okay? See Thank you soon. Thank you, you all. Weekend for now, you guys. See you soon. Weekend, all. Courage. Bye. Thank you.